hi, everybody, uh, and welcome to today's session. Uh, me, myself, uh, Mama Shahraz, president of Government Blockchain Association UA Chapter, and my colleagues, Wendy Charles and uh, Mark Allen from GBA Global. Welcome you to a special GBA session with uh, amazing Digital Week Online. Government Blockchain Association, or GBA, as it's called, is headquartered in Virginia, USA, and we have around 50 chapters around the world. We are a technology agnostic global association, and our mission is to promote and accelerate blockchain adoption in public sector via education, advocacy, and partnerships. Uh, just a small disclaimer, we are not affiliated with any government or private entity, uh, and we do not endorse any projects mentioned here. Um, and all this and, and information in this project uh, should be in this session should be construed, should not be construed as legal, financial, or investment advice and should be used only for educational purposes. Uh, with that, I'm gonna start uh, this session with uh, this graph and today's topics about uh, combating the pandemic we are facing uh, with the blockchain. So on March 11th, when who declared COVID-19 as pandemic, uh, close to 4,000 people uh, died, lost their lives, mainly in, in China. Fast forward eight months, um, more, unfortunately more than a million people lost their lives, mostly out of, outside of China. So this pandemic not only, only caused loss of life, but also caused major economic recession, which many economists say that it's even worse than the Great Depression. So today we have we are going to talk about how the government is using technologies like blockchain to tackle to monitor and tackle uh, the pandemic. And we have uh, two experts from GB Global, Wendy, uh, Dr. Wendy, and Marky, to to do a, to do a small presentation, and then we're going to have a question and answer session. So before that, I'll pass over to uh, Mark, Wendy, Dr. Wendy, and, and Alan to introduce themselves, uh, and uh, and then continue with the presentation. Over to you. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, Maud, for the kind introduction. I'm Wendy Charles. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at First IQ. And I work for a company that specializes in healthcare blockchains. And so that is the lens through which I'll be sharing about uh, government initiatives for blockchain. And uh, my name is Marquis Allen. I am the CEO of Clinical Squared Incorporated. We are a multidisciplined technology and solution development company that serves the healthcare community. We create software tools that are designed to um, simplify complex data in a word. And we're using tech innovations like blockchain and artificial intelligence to power some of the solutions we're creating for healthcare. Yes, and so now we'll start into our presentation. Um, this, this slide just shares the complexity of introducing any new solution in a COVID response. There are so many entities that need to come together in order to enable the oper interoperability as well as operations and compliance. And if you could click mode. Um, there are several types of initiatives that are common uh, for blockchain efforts at COVID-19 right now. Among these are you know, tracking infections, disease outbreaks, crisis management, which also includes emergency responses, um, securing medical supply chains, and and also donations tracking, but the donations tracking can also include blood donation tracking. All right, next slide. Now we're gonna provide several examples of different initiatives that governments are using around the world. And we did, we are not experts in these individual technologies. And as Mo shared in the introduction, we're not endorsing any particular technology, but just sharing that there's greater awareness of blockchain among government organizations and that there is increased use of blockchain for some of these solutions. So for, COVID responses in Europe, for example, um, the Netherlands specifically 
partnered with a company called Timeless, or I'm not sure if that's the, the correct pronunciation, to map and analyze the medical supply chain. But of greatest consideration, there has been a, a lot of discussion among the European Commission about some e-health network guidelines. And the primary focus of those guidelines were interoperability, cross-border data sharing, as well as a huge focus on privacy. And there is a blockchain-based solution called DP3T. And it was reassuring to see the European Commission offer guidelines for interoperability with that particular network. Next slide, please. So in Asia, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, China has really been um, uh, demonstrating that they that want to lead the way in developing blockchain solutions in a, in a number of different verticals. But as far as healthcare and, and the management of the, the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, they've leveraged over 20 different applications for online screening, uh, for management of health records, for tracking and tracing of donations and the like. Um, Hong Kong, as you can see by the slide, uh, has been using a solution called TraceSafe uh, which are disposable wristbands. They've been used since the end of March of this year uh, to assist in managing and enforcing uh, the quarantine program that, uh, that the state has uh, implemented for foreign visitors and for returning citizens. Mode, next slide, please. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, the UAE has stopped using paper documents and they use UAE Vault for digital authentication of documents and health status. Uh, noteworthy um, also is uh, the MVC Global and Cox Logistics uh, partnership in Bahrain that is using a solution called Smart Hub um, that integrates blockchain with a serialized track and trace um, function, IoT sensors, and a a module that is called SmartPass uh, that uses smart contracts for compliance and, and government clearances. Uh, next slide. Um, in uh, Central and South America, the Honduras government uh, partnered with Emerge to launch a blockchain app, Civitas, to track individuals' um, COVID status to allow them to travel um, to healthcare facilities. Um, so it's like kind of like a pass um, to leave home in spite of stay-at-home orders. Now for the other examples listed on this slide, I'm not entirely sure if these are government initiatives or if these are simply blockchain initiatives that were proposed to the government. I, I did wanna share, I have been working with a partner in Mexico at, who shared that Mexico's health system is largely paper-based and the COVID initiative greatly increased interest in developing blockchain-based solutions to move the country into more electronic-based health record status. You know, Dr. Wendy, if I could interject something on that point, I, I do remember yeah. seeing that Prescripto uh, was the blockchain impact award winner uh, according to Newsweek in the United States. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that, that, to your point, is actually a government initiative or a private initiative, mm -hmm. but I would venture to say because it was a, an award winner uh, that it, it most likely got the attention of, of government officials and, and so forth. So next slide. Yep, next slide. Uh, now, in the United States, uh, it's, it's very interesting, the, the journey of managing the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and utilizing uh, technology innovations, particularly blockchain, to combat it. Um, first point shows that North America is using Chainyard, which is a hyperledger-based uh, platform to create Rapid Supplier Connect, uh, basically um, a technology that allows for the materials management uh, process in healthcare to be tracked, to be traced. Um, 
early on in the pandemic here in the United States, uh, there were horrible shortages, as, as I know that there were around the, the world, horrible shortages in PPEs and ventilators and life-saving equipment. Uh, and so the Rapid Supplier Connect solution uh, was built to, to mitigate that. Uh, probably the most important point on this slide that I wanna highlight was the uh, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, named blockchain an essential technology for, kiting, for fighting COVID-19. Um, and uh, this was in a treatise that they had published that described uh, the solutions that were being implemented in uh, supply chain in particular for uh, how food banks and, and so forth uh, were, were tracking how food was moving. Uh, could also be applied to uh, pharmaceuticals and et cetera. Uh, but the, the fact that uh, this department endorsed blockchain technology as an essential technology, I think is, is very significant for the United States. Um, and also uh, HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services is using uh, Palantir to manage data collected about COVID-19 infections. And this is in conjunction with uh, the CDC and other public health organizations that are associated with, uh, with HHS. Uh, next slide. The, uh, the next slide actually shows uh, uh, an excerpt from uh, an open letter that was signed by several uh, congressmen and representatives uh, in the United States to President Trump. Uh, and as you can see, um, they, they espouse the use of blockchain, uh, citing that uh, you know, the implementation of utilizing blockchain technology could greatly mitigate the effects of the coronavirus. Uh, so this is another significant step from a government perspective that uh, so many of our legislators and policymakers see the value in blockchain technology and how it can secure uh, the sharing of information uh, and uh, the transparency of transactions is, is readily apparent. Next slide. Um, international blockchain uh, collaborations include uh, the World Health Organization uh, launching MIPASA, blockchain-based global control and communication system. Uh, that defect, uh, detects, I'm sorry, COVID-19 outbreaks. It's, it's a little early here in Washington, DC. So I, I still am uh, in the middle of getting caffeinated. Uh, some other initiatives that I found uh, internationally uh, include um, Evernim, uh, ID2020, Microsoft, Consensus Health, and uh, uh, a myriad of other organizations created the COVID Credentials Initiative. Uh, and I think the aim is to develop what they call immunity passports. Um, for those that are familiar with the space, Evernim and ID2020 have been leading the, the charge really uh, globally uh, with digital identities and using blockchain technology. Uh, and so the COVID Credentials Initiative uh, is, is aiming to create immunity passports using DIDs uh, and checking the spread of COVID. Um, consensus also has been, and uh, we didn't mention this on the slide, but it just kind of came to mind at the 11th hour as I was thinking about international uh, collaborations. Um, consensus, Microsoft and Ernst & Young uh, created a tool called the Baseline Protocol uh, which includes privacy enhancements to enable enterprises to use uh, the Ethereum public blockchain while retaining the confidentiality of both the data and smart contract contents. And it's actually being explored for contact tracing. This is significant because many of the solutions that I'm privy to, and Dr. Wendy, you can um, correct me or, or tell me if you have any, any other knowledge. Most of the contact tracing solutions that I have seen are Bluetooth based uh, and they have security vulnerabilities where uh, you can um, fake the presence of individuals just by copying their Bluetooth tag and so forth. Um, consensus uh, has opined that using the baseline protocol solution that they've developed with Microsoft and EY could mitigate some of that uh, nefarious usage in contact tracing. 
Uh, we can go to the next slide. And uh, in, for implementation of any blockchain-based systems, there are a lot of questions, challenges, but COVID has introduced some different spins on some of the challenges that we've been facing for a while. Of course, we've been talking about legality of smart contracts, different aspects of interoperability, but I really want to focus on a couple points on this slide to highlight some of the um, controversies and debates. So for, in order for us to reopen society, especially in a very mobile society, there is need for people to travel. And as we've been talking about, creating passports or sharing uh, immunity passports or sharing information, how do we do so in an ethical and responsible manner when people travel to other countries? Should there be cross-border data sharing? If so, how can we do this in a legal and ethical manner? Another consideration for the government sharing is a debate about decentralization versus centralization of information. Now, of course, blockchain is based on the concept of decentralization, but when it comes to large public health initiatives, should there be some type of government oversight that provides stability to the information as well as controlling access? And this point hasn't been as well established yet as we would like. Um, for some of the solutions, organizations are arguing that governments should have more control over privacy. But you know that takes away from what we really value about blockchain with its decentralization. Mm -hmm. Going on to data privacy, I also wanted to share, there has been a very difficult balance across many countries in the world about creating that balance of access to um, a public health surveillance organizations to personal information versus the privacy of private citizens. And in Europe, for example, with GDPR, there is an exception to GDPR for public health surveillance activities, but there have been some additional uses of blockchain-based systems that go beyond public health surveillance into um, more private uh, individual uses of their information, which fall outside of the public health surveillance exception. And so there has been consideration and concern about how do we still adhere to all of the GDPR requirements, say for the right to be forgotten. Um, for sustainability, we just urge organizations and governments considering blockchain solutions, not just to focus on the most immediate crisis, but also to think about how long are we going to be facing either the COVID situation or how are we gonna be prepared for the next public health crisis that arises? We know that COVID isn't going to be the last virus or public health initiative that we face as a global society. And so how do we create a solution that doesn't just get us through this current situation, but helps prepare us more effectively for some of the future issues? And for um, ethical protections, Marquis, do you wanna share with the group about what we've been working on in GPA? Yeah, actually that's a really good uh, segue. Uh, so I, uh, in addition to uh, leading Clinical Squared, I am the, uh, the team lead for the healthcare working group. Uh, for the GBA. And we have been working on a project over the past year to create uh, an ethical design framework for blockchain solutions in the healthcare space. Um, in healthcare, there's so many ethical conundrums as it is. When you add to that um, some of the ethical uh, issues that come up with using a technology like blockchain. Uh, we felt that it was very important to, to give some guidance to, to stakeholders uh, from large health organizations to policymakers to um, organizations that are looking to embrace uh, blockchain, just so that they understand really the scope of what blockchain can do uh, and how it could potentially harm uh, if not implemented properly. 
Uh, something else that I wanted to touch on that Dr. Wendy had said uh, about the, the question between decentralization and centralization. It's very pivotal in, in healthcare, especially because, as she said, uh, decentralization is the, the focus point for blockchain technology, but hospitals don't really want decentralized access to their data uh, mm. to, be, uh, to be given to the public at this point. Um, the, the solutions that I have seen healthcare systems in the United States be interested in are all centralized, uh, at least uh, at the beginning. And so this kind of factors into whether or not uh, some of these solutions can be employed legally in, in the case of, of public health issues. Um, Dr. Wendy had said also that GDPR has an exception for public health emergencies and, and public health uh, usage uh, around uh, personal data being retained and so forth. But that kind of makes this point all the more sticky and something that, that really needs to be um, uh, handily uh, resolved uh, after you know, a lot of thought and, and debate and, and consideration. And that's all I'll say about that. Uh, it, we can move to the next slide. And uh, I know that um, we, we know that governments are looking at blockchain because they have seen the usefulness of it in other industries prior to COVID. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, they, uh, they've seen the, the, the acceptance of blockchain um, kind of have upticks because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic and not just in healthcare and in other industries. Um, another kind of uh, uh, insight into some of the things that I'm working on. I live in Washington, DC. I was appointed by the mayor to uh, a project called the Financial Services Regulatory Sandbox and Innovation Council, where we deign to create a sandbox to um, to experiment with blockchain technology, specifically in fintech. Well, this project uh, started late last year, and we were on track to, uh, to do a lot of good things this year. And then COVID hit and put everybody back on their heels. Once everybody kind of recovered a little bit from how we had to adapt to our new normal, uh, we in the council for the financial services regulatory sandbox said we really need to expedite our efforts to get these solutions out uh, and experiment with them, see what they're useful for. Um, and then by extension, apply them to other industries. Uh, for instance, the health information exchange that's being built in, in Washington, DC. Um, we, we think that uh, the acceptance is just going to increase as more blockchain solutions are developed and they, they prove their worth in the, the public eye. Um, and, uh, and also coming from the GBA, uh, we understand that we need to really educate people about the successes of some of these solutions that are being employed. Um, uh, let the government know, let our representatives know that, hey, blockchain is being applied in, in these particular verticals very successfully. Uh, and there are opportunities for the government to adopt these technologies uh, in other ways to, to effectively combat COVID. Um, I think that's I think that's really the main stuff. Dr. Wendy, do you have anything that you want to add? I, I kind of went on a tangent yeah. there at the end. Oh, that's great. I, I just wanted to add the importance. Um, so first of all, please do join uh, GBA. Um, just go to the website gbaglobal.org and, and sign up if you can, because it's a fantastic organization that provides education and advocacy. There are a number of wonderful educational sessions. In fact, I attended one yesterday where uh, congressional staffers um, from the United States were talking about their legal initiatives and working with congressmen and, and how important it is for us to educate our leaders about what blockchain is. Um, they reminded us that um, in some recent congressional debates, some of our congressmen didn't even know what Facebook was or how it worked. <laughs> 
And uh, blockchain is that much more complicated. And uh, so we're going to, it's it's gonna be an ongoing initiative, but we're going to need global support and uh, a lot of eff- uh, a lot of grassroots efforts for us to make much more progress as well. Fantastic. Uh, we just have like ten minutes, so I'll just ask a quick question. Has the audience okay. known that right, right now that uh, both Wendy and Martin are part of a healthcare working group, and also you are part of a research group where you meet the public sector officials at the same time, the private sector. Uh, so, so the first question is, uh, what challenges do you think they're facing? You know, um, if these these guys are facing. Uh, both in public and private sector to implement the blockchain. Yeah, that's one question. Sure. Um, so. Why don't we both answer this? And I, I, I'm happy to to start. So, uh, what is the first obstacle? Money. <laughs> That's the primary obstacle right now, especially with a lot of budget cuts um, due to lack of tax uh, tax money availability. Um, even for healthcare organizations, they had a, a, a huge setback with uh, but budgetary issues due to treating COVID patients. So money has is the primary issue. Another consideration is that there has been some regulatory uncertainty about how best to implement uh, blockchain in different sectors. Um, For healthcare, there's been uncertainty about how best to meet the requirements of the HIPAA security rule, GDPR, and other governments' healthcare privacy legislation. And so some governments are wading through interpretations of their privacy regulations in order to best advise how to implement blockchain in that sector. For sure. Yeah. And from a government perspective, uh, I think Dr. Wendy touched on it, uh, reviewing the regulations and the policies that are on the books now for governing uh, data transfer and data transmission and exchange of information in the healthcare vertical um, has not really been created for, for blockchain. Um, and, and so we see a, a real need for, um, for reform in, in that regard to spur adoption and, and increase the likelihood that um, these solutions can be available to, to healthcare widespread. From a, a healthcare centric perspective, I know from the hospitals and, and from a lot of the practices that I've spoken to, they're still just dipping their toe in the water about how effective blockchain is. It's, it's such a new technology and healthcare as a rule in the States doesn't wanna be a maverick. They don't like blazing any trails. They like very concise understood processes uh, because of the, the regulatory requirements that they have. Um, and so um, the, the advent of additional technologies that are blockchain featured that can prove their metal uh, in the public space will go a long way to encouraging healthcare organizations to take a hard look and, and feel confident that the technology that they're implementing will have positive results for them. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, just one last question uh, since we have uh, less time. Uh, I know that most of the projects are work in progress because uh, they started working on uh, just, on, I guess most of them are since March. Uh, what, what is that? There's, is there something for which blockchain could possibly, is a possible solution to fight against you know, this pandemic, which is not being used at the moment, you know? What is a possible solution you think, you know? Um, yeah. I can start with that. Uh, and, and I can tell you from, Uh, some of the experiences that I've had with Clinical Squared, we are working with a client to develop a health information exchange centric solution with some of our tools where healthcare organizations can share specific information about their practice to participating members, specifically in the fight of COVID. Uh, And one of the modules that we're very excited about that we're in, in the midst of development for Uh, allows a hospital to let the hospitals in their area know what their census looks like, how many patients are in their hospital, how many beds they have available, what those patients are suffering from. So 
uh, we feel that this will be a, a, a very useful technology uh, in the case where we had at the beginning of the pandemic, we had a run on hospitals where hospitals were overwhelmed and they didn't know where to, to send people. Um, we're building a tool where a hospital at their discretion can share very specific information with their neighbors and find out if some of the other hospitals in the area are not close to capacity and can probably take some of the, the excess patient load that they've had. Um, if a hospital has patients that present to them and that hospital is not equipped to serve the patient uh, with you know, the, the uh, specialties that they have, they can check within the cohort, their local cohort, and find out what other hospitals, healthcare systems, providers are in the area that can treat this, this patient that has special needs. Um, it's not a widespread use yet. Uh, and, and I think that using health information exchange as, um, as a model could really show some benefit and, and really prove how blockchain uh, would be valuable. Yeah, and um, thank you, Marquis, for that example. And I'll just touch on a tangent. Um, one component that hasn't been used as widely as it should be is uh, for the data silos that we have among the research data sets being established. And while there's a plethora of research being conducted, um, data sharing has been an obstacle. So one initiative that First IQ undertook is a partnership with the American Heart Association and Hitachi, where we were able to place a number of different uh, hundreds of data sets on a blockchain and enable granular consent and complex ownership for those data sets so that they could be shared with researchers uh, more effectively. And with that, uh, I, I know that we were running out of time mm -hmm. and our good friend Mode has lost connection. Uh, that really concludes the, the bulk of what we wanted to present. Um, I hope we were uh, informative and, mm -hmm. and the audience came away with, you know, maybe a little bit more information that they didn't have. Uh, and they can really see not only the, the continued opportunity for blockchain to be used, uh, in fighting the pandemic, but some of the efforts that governments around the world are are uh, undertaking to mm -hmm. to embrace that technology. With that, uh, are there any questions <laughs> from the audience? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not Thank sure you. how to go now because our moderator <laughs> kind of dropped off. Um, but. Uh, Dr. Wendy, is there any last thing you wanted to add? Um, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, uh, Marquis and I had provided our email addresses on the last slide that we had presented. Please do reach out to us if you have any additional questions or ideas. Um, we are eager to learn. We're also eager for you to join any of the many global, uh, excuse me, government blockchain association initiatives.